the overall theme is going to be how, what data can we collect and what is useful data in the regional planning process. So the theme here is how do we leverage broadband for social and economic um, development uh, throughout those regions. One of the things that in the world that we've worked in, <coughs> we've been working on in broadband data collection, data um, broadband planning for quite a few years, is that if you go back five, six years, it was very hard to even get people talking about what we call utilization. We use different language, but we're talking, what do you do on the internet once you have it? Four or five years ago, that was hard. You couldn't even get people talking about it because front and, front and present was always people who didn't have internet. That issue still exists. It's not gone. <coughs> but finally, we're starting to spend more and more time talking about, so you do have internet. How do you use it? How do you derive benefits? Whether you're talking about households, businesses, um, community anchor institutions. So the work that we're doing, um, the data we'll be presenting today, is essentially focusing on what we call utilization. It's what you do with the internet once you have it. Um, it is interesting that when you deal particularly around households, a lot of the dynamics are almost identical in the sense of the determinants of who use the internet effectively <coughs> are very similar to who does and doesn't adopt. Um, but when we get into the business side and we talk about community anchor institutions, uh, the dynamics get, uh, well, there's more data, it's a different set of patterns. So essentially the data we collected, I'm going to try to do a couple of things here. I am going to present some data, but I'm not trying to focus on the data. Um, there's just what you'll see in a few minutes. We collected a very large uh, amount of data. So on this presentation, I'm going to try to focus more on what are the key messages we can take away. So I'm going to throw up some numbers. But let's not get hung up on it. You're going to have access to this, I believe. It's going to be available to slide deck on, online afterwards. So let's let's not get intimidated if I start throwing numbers on. If I go through it some reasonably fast, it's because I'm trying to focus on what the key messages are. But there is data available. And one of the things that I will stress is uh, one of the purposes of the presentation is to give you a sense of the range of data that will be available through the regional planning process um, that PCI is, um, is heading up. So I would like you to get a sense of the range of data, because this is not just a static report. The data is available in a, in a dynamic manner that the staff from PCI can help you access if you can articulate what the questions are. 90% um, of the data is geocoded so that we can uh, locate the responses and break down the responses by geography. So the, basically the data we collect, even though we talk about utilization, we collect data on connectivity. Not so we can map it, but so when we look at how people utilize the internet, we can see if there's relations to how, what kind of connectivity they have. We looked at impacts, um, jobs, um, kind of revenues it brings in, impact on the uh, household economy. Uh, we look at barriers, we look at skills. Um, but again, it's interesting because I hear in Karen talk, I think we're all starting to look at the same things, that uh, you're, you're starting to address some of the same issues. The data that we collected, so the purpose is, as I just mentioned, is essentially to give you a sense of the data, and the purpose is, is for planning, essentially. Planning and program design. I think more and more of us are getting to the point where we've done enough planning, let's start using the data for something practical on the ground. So wherever possible, I know the work that we do, and I know PCI is in the same situation, we're always asking ourselves, not only what are the findings, but how can we use these findings in a practical way on the ground, whether it's in designing programs, um, developing policy and what have you. So I'm going to be focusing on uh, how can we use this data as much as possible. Uh, a quick overview of the data we collected. This is online surveys. Even though the household data, the people who were invited to take the survey, these people received personal invitations, um, was randomly, uh, they were selected randomly across the state. The reality is, is that people self-select them. So this is, let's not treat this as a random representative sample. What we're essentially looking for are patterns. And, and that is what we have found and I'll be reporting on. So essentially we got responses back from over 7,000 organizations across um, the state and over 2,000 households. Of the organizations, about 4,600 are commercial um, businesses, uh, 14, almost 1,500 are government entities, mostly local government, and about over 1,100 were nonprofits. We have over 2,000 of our organizations that classify themselves as uh, community anchor institutions. Um, in the questions we asked, the organizations, there was a core set of questions that all organizations, commercial, non-commercial, got asked. 
And then if they, an organization identified itself as being a library or a local government, there was a set of a small module set of questions that was specific to how they use the internet for their particular mission and mandate. Um, of the data that uh, we collected, 52% of all the organization responses came from Chicago. And for households, because we were targeting, we did an oversampling in the non-metro area, um, only 24% of uh, responses from households came from Chicago. So now I'm going to try to get into what are the big messages. What, are the, what have we learned? So I'm going to start off with, well, we know broadband matters. Part of what we try to do is understand what the dynamics are. I think we all know broadband matters. So the, the issue, that's not the question. It's how does it matter? How do we break down the information so we have uh, one that we understand it and that we're able to articulate, um, communicate that to policymakers, to planners, etc. So I'm going to start on the top right hand side. So the first thing is at the household level. We were, this is a surprising number, but it's consistent in the four states that we've collected data in the last two years. About 20% of households run a home-based business. We actually asked the question twice. Is we asked the list of uses and people put home-based business. Later in the survey, we asked, and we give a precise definition of what a home-based business is. And it's not working from home. And based on that more precise definition, 18% of households in Illinois said that they had a home-based business. Um, and the other thing that was quite interesting is almost 11, uh, almost 12% say that they're planning in the coming year to set up a home-based business. So it makes an impact at the home. Um, it, in particular, when you're dealing with economic troubled times and in rural areas where there's less diverse, diversity of economic, or economic opportunity, you tend to have a higher level of home-based businesses because it's a key thing for economic um, survival in, in some rural areas. I have a rural bias. So if, uh, if that comes across, well, that's, that's the way it is. But I tend to focus on rural areas because that's the planning that I come from, but it's also a lot of the work we do is focusing on rural areas that are losing population and whose economies are, are struggling. Um, so I find myself in a little bit different situation. I'm usually making this presentation in rural areas to local leaders, etc. and here I am in metropolis. Um, so second little box there is, so it makes a difference to households. Location, location. Um, what our data shows both for businesses and for households is they make decisions on whether they're going to move from their existing community or if they're already on the move and they select the community. It's not only do you have broadband. If you go back three or four years, we'd be in this room and saying, well, do they have broadband? Do they have broadband? That's less and less the question. It's now what kind of broadband do you have? Businesses and households make locational decisions on the basis of whether you have broadband and what's the quality of broadband. Um, in rural, in non-metro areas, that's a really critical point, and it's kind of like the, the steady drip of a faucet. Um, you may only lose one or two percent every year of your population because the households are moving, but you start adding that up over time, and you are losing a significant percent of your population. Business is the same story. So it makes a difference for locational decisions. I'm not sure to what extent that happens at the neighborhood level in metro metropolitan areas. Um, I suspect it's the same dynamic. It probably plays out a bit differently, but it's probably the same dynamic. Um, so now we've looked at, okay, so it has an Im impact on businesses and households. How it's reflected is in the businesses, we actually have the data, and I'll be, I think I've got one of the slides that shows that, using the internet results in higher revenue from internet sources. It's, it's like a no-brainer, but we can show there is a demonstrated impact on businesses that by adopting the internet, they are able to generate revenues, and the more you use the internet, the more you re generate revenues from internet sources. No brainer, but it's important to say, yes, it has an impact. And then the last one is jobs, jobs, jobs. And I'll get into a couple of slides that go into that in more depth. But essentially, of the organizations that, that gave us information, I think we had over 2,000 organizations, you know, I forget the exact number, 1,500 organizations in Illinois gave us data on their job loss and creation in the last 12 months, and how much of that job or loss creation is related to the internet. And basically, they said 22% of all new job creation was related to the internet. Now, this is not high-tech jobs. It could be a forklift operator. But now that company is part of a logistics network um, uh, supply chain. Um, and the only way that job exists is because that company now is tied into that international supply chain. So when we ask, is, would that job exist with or without internet? Um, so it's an integral part of jobs, job creation. So, job, so broadband matters. 
But we also want to ask, okay, so why does it matter? So what is it that impacts at the organizational level? This is on the organizational side. Essentially, the main reason people benefit, organizations benefit from the internet is productivity. In a way, that's no surprise if you take a look at how you use the internet, that's probably the biggest, it just makes your life a hell of a lot easier, a more efficient use of your time. But it's important to remember that because sometimes we focus just on revenue. Revenue is not the primary. We asked 12 motivating factors, and revenue and costs were kind of in the middle of the pack. The number one uh, re reasons are what we have to raise two separate ones. This is make operations easier and more effective use of resources, but essentially that's one, it's productivity. Um, the second one, though, was a bit more of a surprise in that it's very much a focus on the customer, supporting your existing customers and expanding your reach to a new customer base. Those are the two primary um, reasons, and again, state after state, it's the same message. And it's important to know what is the benefit if you're going to try to get businesses on side. It's important to realize you're not promising them a huge increase necessarily in income, but you're providing productivity, you're providing customers. I think one of the key things, um, I don't know to what extent this applies in Chicago, but in the non-metro areas, this is absolutely critical. Um, it's a shift to the knowledge-based economy and how the internet, the role the internet plays in that. Um, so what I'm going to do is show you two slides that are very heavy on data, but I'm going to walk you through them. Essentially, the internet is an integral part of communities, regional economies, in, tr in making that trans transition to the knowledge economy. And I don't want to exaggerate what that is, but it is an integral part of how businesses and more your revenues are derived from the internet. Um, again, it seems like a no-brainer, but it's important to state that fact. So the first thing, when we look at how internet use varies, it varies geographically. So no surprise, the urban area, which has the greatest density of natural human networks, and that is really critical, is that, and this research goes back in various nations, I've seen it in Europe, essentially the more dense your network is, the more easily information um, is shared across your closed natural networks whether you talk institutional, between local governments, whether you talk about households, you talk about businesses. So the denser you are and the more diverse you are, the more naturally the adoption process happens. And, and adoption is not just adoption of the internet, but of specific types of applications. So Chicago, as an urban, diversified area, has the highest use. By the way, you'll see on the, uh, on the right-hand side, the sample size, that gives you a sense of how much data points we have for um, each of those regions. These are the 10 re planning regions for PCI. And you'll basically see that as you get into the more rural areas, um, they basically have a lower utilization. The relevance here, and it came up earlier in Karen's com comments, is you can then target. 